Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good to be with the saints this morning. If you want to open up your uh, bulletins, we'll go over a few things together. Prayers. 
Steve Myers, um, Ro and her colleagues, Jeremy Henderson, Jim Kermitz, Sheila. Any updates, Sheila? I got part of my results back, but now I have to see a hematologist in two weeks. Okay. So you got part of her results back, but uh, has to see a specialist. I probably keep her in your prayers. Jack Whitehouse, Mother Blank, the Eckerly uh, family, uh, the laws of Janice, uh, the Hill family, and the Freeman family. Uh, Jake and Kate and Zuber, Jackie Wilson. Um, continue to keep Jackie uh, in your prayers. The fever has broke, uh, but she, she still could really use uh, your prayers. She's having a number of health concerns. Uh, Jackie Rodriguez, she's having surgery tomorrow, correct? So she's, um, she's having surgery tomorrow for a hip replacement. Okay. So keep Jackie in your prayers. Abby Brower, uh, Aaron Everett, uh, keep Aaron in your prayers and his family and the decisions uh, that he has to make. Uh, I'm traveling this week, so keep my travel in your prayers. Keep Mr. Harbor's travel. Uh, he's headed to Oregon. I'm headed to Montana. Keep that in your prayers. What else should we be at? Logan? My car is broke down. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so keep Logan's transportation situation. What else? Yes, thank you. You even wrote me a note. So Eve is not feeling well. She's got a fever. Been sick for a while here, so keep the keep body in your prayers. What else? Anything? All right, if there's not, go ahead and turn to song number four. Song number four, we'll sing first and last. <coughs> If you have the new books, all you have is first and last. Song number four. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And opened the life gate.
pray that you would bless them, help them as they learn and as they grow and as they um, find out more and more about you, Lord God, and what it really means to be a Christian. Father, I'm grateful and thankful for the work that was done with them. Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with this assembly today, that those who are here and are saved, Lord God, would be built up, would be edified, would be able to be, or would be given the tools and would utilize the tools to learn to overcome to a greater degree so that each one of us can finish this race the way that you would have us to finish the race, that we would be those who, who really do overcome. Father, uh, through you, that's the natural process. Um, Lord, please help us to engage in that process. Lord, we got a lot of physical things to be thankful for. We're particularly grateful and thankful that uh, the clerk kids have recovered, Lord God. Just uh, thankful that they're uh, back and healthy and all able to be with us. Lord, I pray that you be with uh, Shelly as she continues to uh, improve. And I just pray that you would bless her recovery, Lord God. I pray that you would uh, be with her and bless her. I'm thankful for her and thankful for Roe. I pray that you would be with Rose, uh, continue to help difficulties. Lord, I pray that you be with the Eckerly family. I pray that uh, you would bring them uh, comfort during this time of loss and the Hill family as well. Father, uh, something that uh, I didn't remember to, to share with the saints, but I pray that you would be with uh, the Love family, Lord, as uh, Abby went on uh, to be with you this week, and I just pray that uh, you would bless uh, her, and I pray that, her, that you would bless her family, Lord God, and bless the congregation there in Billings, Lord, uh, with uh, this loss. Father, I'm thankful that uh, we don't have to be uh, sorrowful for Abby, uh, but uh, that uh, we will uh, miss her, and I pray that you would be with uh, them. Lord, I pray that you would be with Eve, that she would be able to be back with us, that she would uh, be healthy, you know that she does a lot with the kids, and I just pray that uh, you would uh, bless her and help her be able to get back uh, to her full health and her full impact. Father, I pray that you would bless the blessing today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 6. <clears throat> Second Samuel, the sixth chapter. You know, sometimes I get accused of. Uh, Cherry picking uh, the passages uh, and uh, taking the the best um, and my favorite and the meatiest and um, I don't know where those accusations come from, uh, <laughs> but they're all true. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, hey, if you're assigned the, the scriptures, you do the same thing. So, all right. So, Second Samuel chapter six. And we're going to read 1 through 11. 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 11. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. And they placed the ark of God uh, on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, uh, cast nets, and cymbals. But when they had come to the threshing floor of Nathan, Uzzah reached out towards the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. 
And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence. And he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. So David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? And David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him, but David took it uh, aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. All right, there's a lot here. One of the things that I want us to, work, to think about a little bit is the holy versus the profane. When we talk about profane, a lot of times, and I'm actually going to talk about this in a couple weeks um, as we go through 1 Thessalonians, but a lot of times when we think about the profane, we think about the bad. And that is correct. Uh, you know, you think about the root of profanity, right? It's coarse, bad um, language. Okay? Profane, though, and actually the definition for profane, while it certainly has the connotation of that which is unholy, okay, it also is a reference to that which is common. The profane is that which is common. And so I want you to think for just a second about, as we're looking at this passage and we're looking at the Old Testament as a whole, that which is holy versus that which is common. Common is, is that which is unholy, that which is profane. And so when we're taking a look at this, I just kind of want some of those thoughts going through your head because, of course, it's going to stand out to you, the passage in, in Titus, to the pure, all things are pure, and how in our system, what God has cleansed is holy. Okay? That for the Christian, there are all of it is whole, right? So I want us to kind of think about this uh, in reference to this passage in particular, the holy, that is, the ark of the Lord versus the profane. Okay? So David takes uh, 30,000 men. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that we really haven't heard that much about the ark of the Lord for a while, okay? So if you go all the way back, the last time we get a lot of information about the Ark of the Lord is 1 Samuel chapter 7. The last time that we get a lot of information about the Ark of the Lord. It hasn't been talked about. Um, Saul actually calls for it in 1 Samuel 14, uh, but that's just a, a brief reference. And so David's taken 30,000 men, and we're going, and we're getting the Ark. Okay? Again, or one of the things I want to point out here is that noble intentions. Think very clearly, right? Noble intentions that David has for uh, to to receive the ark of the Lord, to bring in the ark of the Lord, uh, and they're going to go get the ark at Kiriath Jerem. Um, here in verse two, it uses uh, the name Baal. Judah, that is uh, its pagan name, okay? Uh, we, would, we would call it Kiriath uh, Jerem. And it says, the ark of the Lord, if you want to check me out on that, Joshua 15, 9, and verse, uh, Joshua 15, and verse 60, if you're interested in that, to show that Kiriath Jerem and Bill Judah are the same. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and it says, the ark of the Lord is called by the name. The name. Well, the name. There's something significant there. At the end of verse 2, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. The ark is called by the name of the Lord. By the name of Yahweh. Okay? By the name that is above all names. By uh, the king uh, of kings. 
And it's called by the name because of whose presence is there. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 24. An example here of uh, blaspheming the name. Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24 and verse, verses 11 through 16. And the son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name and cursed. So they brought him to Moses. Now his mother's name was Shelmeth, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him into custody so that the command of the Lord might be made clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the one who cursed outside the camp. And let all who heard him lay their hands on them, and then let all the congregation stone him. And you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If anyone curses his God, then he shall bear excuse me, then he shall bear his sin. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. The name, the importance of the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is above all other names, above principalities, above powers, the name of the King of, King of Kings, the name of the Yahweh of hosts. And if we think about this name, it is the name through which we confess, right? So when we make our confession into Jesus Christ, what do we say? The Jesus is Lord. Or that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. They're both synonymous terms that communicate and convey the same thing and can be used interchangeably. Okay? So that communication, okay, what are we confessing? Jesus is the King of Kings. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Yahweh of hosts. Jesus is above all. So communication. And it's not by accident that the Lord has the steps of the plan of salvation the way that he does. Okay? So not only do we confess the name, but then what? Aren't we immersed into the name? We're immersed into the name of Jesus Christ. See, God wants us to know that his name is above all names. And there's no getting into Jesus Christ unless you're going to get in through the name. He's like, the only way to get into Christ is to be immersed into the name. But for those of us who are in Christ, not only do we live that confession out, the confession of the name out on a continual basis, but also don't we pray in the name? Our prayers and our supplications are going through the name. See, in that name, we can prove through other number of other scriptures, that name is Jesus Christ. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is Lord. And so, understanding the importance of the name here. And so the name, the Ark of the Covenant, is called by the name because that's where the presence is. Now, wait a second. Okay, again, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but where does the name dwell now? And whose name are we called by? And isn't it prophesied that we're going to get a new name? And isn't it even in the term Christian? We are Christ. We are of the name now. Now again, nobody hear me wrong. I'm not saying that we are Yahweh. But I'm saying that we are Yahweh's. We are Yahweh's. We are in his family. We are his kids. Okay? And he has given us the family name. See, it's important to know the name. And it's at that same name, according to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess what? That Jesus is Lord. He is above all. So the name is of paramount importance. The name is holy. Okay? So God's earthly presence 
is above the ark. We're going back to 1 Samuel chapter 6. <coughs> 1 Samuel, the sixth chapter. Let's back up from Uzzah for just a second. 
think it does, it should back up. Uh, <laughs> back up from Isa for just a second and talk about this, this cart. Um, now, it says a couple times about this new cart. Oh, that's that. You know, it's the Ark of the Lord. We better, we better get a new cart, right? I don't know why it is any old cart. We'll make sure that we got the best of the best here that we're rolling out for the Ark of the Lord. But uh, the conclusion that Dave is going to come to, also, I don't know if I mentioned this later. Guys, in 1 Chronicles 13, okay, parallel passage to this, check that out uh, as well. A um, little bit more information, I don't think that I go there. But uh, So let's, let's get this new car. But there's a, there's a problem with that, and that problem we find in Exodus 25. Exodus 25, starting in verse 12. Yeah, I encourage you to read above that for more context. But. And you shall cast four gold rings for it and fasten them on its four feet. And two rings shall be on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the, the ark, and they shall not be removed. So, God <laughs> specifically makes provisions for the ark's transportation. And he says, okay, you're going to put these poles in there, and these poles are not to be uh, removed. Okay? And he gives very specific instructions on how that is uh, to work. If you take a look at Exodus 37, Exodus 37, the poles were, were designed, made with a table wood, and I think if I remember correctly, the poles were overlaid with gold as well. Exodus 37 and verse 5. And he put the poles into the rings on the side of it to carry it. Okay? There was even a procedure to transport the ark. You should look at uh, Numbers chapter 4. Okay? And even, it, it tells us, I think it's in Numbers 4, you read through that. Like they were supposed to put porpoise skin over it. Because, again, are you just going to look at where the presence of the Lord is? I mean... There's reasons for this if we kind of think these things through, but we're not going to read through all of Numbers chapter 4. But even within those procedures, so it says, do these things, okay? Carry it this way. Cover it with porpoise skins. This is the way that I want things done. The Lord is really clear. And within those procedures, do you know what he also says? Don't touch it. So what do we see here? Well, we see that David is completely ignoring the transportation procedures. Instead of using the poles that are designed there for the ark to be transported, he decides that a new cart is better. Okay? Um, now, we can kind of get into some of David's thoughts maybe a little bit. Some of that might be worth exploring. But... You know, remember the Philistines brought the ark over on a cart. Now, the Philistines didn't know any that. But you know who did? David. David. David knew that. And David, it seems, even from the scripture, may have not been thinking about that at the time. But is that any sort of excuse? He had the information, he knew, and he decided to ignore it. Okay, so the Philistines brought the ark over on a cart. Well, it stood out to me that the Philistines' behavior then normalized what the people of God did. So they bring the ark over on the cart, so then the people of God assume, well, it's fine, right? They didn't get struck down. It must be okay. Well, I think you can see where I'm going with that. How many times do we let the world normalize what the people of God do? See, 
And they made the assumption that just because the Philistines did something and seemingly got away with it, that that meant that it was holy and okay for the Lord's people, when simply they were reproducing profanity. Okay? David certainly knew better. If we go to 1 Chronicles chapter 15, here's kind of a little bit of his admittance. 1 Chronicles 15. First Chronicles 15, uh, 11 through 15. <coughs> then, call, then David called for Zadok and Abathar, the priests, and for the Levites, and for Uriel, uh, Aziah, Joel, uh, Shemaniah, uh, Alel, and Abinadab, and said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' households of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, both you and your relatives, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, God of Israel, to the uh, place that I have prepared for it. Because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek him according to the ordinance. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the sons of the Levites carried the ark on their shoulders with the poles thereon, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So, what I want to bring out here is that it didn't matter how nice the cart was, what the Lord commanded was carry it with poles, and so when they tried to bring out the cart, it's not going to be pleasing to the Lord. There, no matter how nice the substitute for God's plan is, if it's not God's plan, God's not going to bless it. Okay? And so, when we look there at 2 Samuel chapter 6, I think that, that there's kind of a, an application, at least, that we can make here to the religious world at large. Because in verse 5, what we see is that David and all the house of Israel are celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of interest, instruments. You know, it goes on to name them. What are they doing? They're celebrating before the Lord, right? They're having a religious experience. And their religious experience is based upon something that they think is holy. They're bringing the ark of the Lord. But what's God's attitude in that moment? God is upset. God is angry. And so they have this religious experience. They have... Uh, this time where maybe we say it this way today, I really felt close to God. And God is about to strike down us. Because God is not pleased. Because what they're doing is not in accordance with the will of God. Well, isn't that basically about the entire religious world that we see around us? Oh, they're, they're saying the name of the Lord. They're having an experience with the presence of God, and the Lord is displeased. And the Lord will strike them down in the way of the past. So you contrast this. See, it's kind of interesting. I was reading, I was reading a uh, non-instrumental commentator. Okay? And the way that not instrumental Church of Christ commentator. He says that the problems with this with the instruments, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. Sure. Okay? Uh, okay. But one of the things that's interesting is you compare this celebration of David to the next celebration of David. See, it's not that the Lord doesn't want us to celebrate. It's not that the Lord doesn't want us to be happy. It's not that the Lord doesn't want us to take joy in his presence. But it has to be in accordance with truth. David's next celebration, from what I can see from the scriptures, is blessed from the Lord. The fact that, that Michael's being bitter about it speaks poorly of Michael, even if she had her reasons as we've seen earlier, speaks poorly of Michael, not of David. Okay? And so again, what is the major question? The major question is, is the Lord pleased with this? And we can see from the Lord's outburst on Uzzah, 
the Lord's justified outburst on Uzzah. He's not happy. And if the Lord's not happy, I won't be in the same place as you. Okay, so it's not the celebration itself that's displeasing, but rather it's the celebration of ignorance. We really do live today uh, making application in a serve me culture. The secular humanism of today has weaved itself into religious culture where the name of God is being inherited and his presence is nowhere to be found. So if you can read verses 6 through 11 as I've made reference to it the whole time. Uzzah reaches out. Uzzah is struck down. What did he do? He tried to treat what is holy as calm. I mean, he did what he'd do for any other box. I don't want it to fall off. You know what? If we treat that which is holy, that is, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, is that which is common? Don't think that we won't get struck down too. Let's go to Ezekiel 44. We'll in there. Yeah. Which is why he's pleased with the next 
Which else? is why you've got you to really be careful of a doctrine that would say that uh, tradition is equal to scripture. Yeah. Right. Because if that was true, Uzzah is, a, is an anomaly. Uzzah was, uh, God was having a bad hair day. Right. Yeah. You know. yeah. Mike. Is there, I, I'm not sure, is there anywhere that says that when they were transporting it, they had it covered? Or was it uncovered? Was that it was it was supposed to be covered? I think it's in Numbers four. Right, I know that it's supposed to be, but in this instance, did you give me any indication? I don't see any indication that it's covered. I don't think it was. Which would be another reason. Yes. Yeah, hundred percent. Should have been. Anybody else? Yeah. So, in, in respect to you know all the things that took place, <coughs> weren't they all equally guilty? Disobedience to God, you know. So why, why, you know? I guess you have to ask why Uzzah gets picked out of the group because David is just as guilty, you know, as Uzzah. Yeah, and I think that they were, they were all guilty before the Lord in that they are participating in something that's displeasing to the Lord. But Uzzah is the guy that reaches out after the Lord says, "You don't touch it." And what's Uzzah do that everybody else doesn't do? Uzzah touches it. So. That's that's on us. So it's not that us is hard. It was any worse than any of the rest of those guys, but he went one more step in disobedience and made it cost him. All right, let's have a prayer. Great glorious Heavenly Father, I'm grateful and thankful for this day. I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that you are just and you are not arbitrary, Lord God. Father, I'm grateful and thankful for uh, your holiness. And the fact that you're willing to share with, with us your holiness. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Morning, Saints. Morning. Uh, today's readings is out of Acts 16, verses 1 through 15. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem, for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonian, Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside of the gate to a riverside, where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the woman who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Thanks, Mike. 648, 648, um, stand up, stand up for Jesus, uh, so you can guess what I'm going to have you do next. Uh, go ahead and stand on up. You know, a passage of scripture in particular, you see Paul going to where the warm contacts are, right? And what's he find? Find somebody praying who's looking for the gospel. Again, where should we be going? Be looking for where uh, warm contacts are, somebody who will dialogue about the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. That will give us an opportunity to stand up, stand up for Jesus. All right, all four verses. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. The time is royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall. Oh, it's man, which held Christ in. 
Turn in your song books to 627. 627, there's a royal banner. And if you want to take out your bulletins, we'll go over a few things uh, with one another. See the announcements that are listed there. Uh, Pennsylvania Family Camp, uh, Mission of the Month. Uh, reminder too, I'll probably put it in next week's bulletin. May 9th is the Walking with Angels in Milan, Michigan. I encourage you to go check that out. If you drop down to the Thanksgivings, uh, you see the ones that are listed there. Uh, I want to bring out a few in particular. Uh, as was mentioned in the first hour, um, Brandon uh, Mangrum and uh, Janelle were immersed into Christ uh, this past week. Brandon on Monday and Janelle on uh, Friday. So super grateful and thankful for that. Um, thankful uh, to have them as part of the family and want to welcome them into Jesus Christ uh, next time uh, you see them. Thankful for uh, Alan and Linnell and their work there. Thankful that Millie is doing better. Um, thankful that she uh, is improving and continue to keep her health in your prayers. You can see the rest of the ones that are listed there as well. I want to add the Clark kids. Uh, they are all uh, healthy and the squad is all here. So we are <coughs> thankful for that. Um, on the prayer request side, you can see uh, those that are listed there. I uh, want to maybe highlight Shelly Ziegler, uh, Rose's uh, sister. Continue to keep her in your prayer. She had surgery uh, this week. And um, so um, keep, keep her recovery in your prayers. Uh, um, keep Eve Peabody uh, in your prayers. She's been sick. She's had a fever <clears throat> uh, for a while here. So keep her in your prayers. Good to see Daryl here with us. How's she doing, Daryl? Yeah. Okay. So add Christy Grant and then also Lori Walker uh, to your list. All righty. Um, and if you've got anything, uh, fill out one of these uh, sheets uh, for us, and uh, I'll get uh, added to the list. Um, uh, if you want to uh, text those to me uh, this week, uh, it'd probably be best as I will be uh, traveling. I leave on Tuesday. Uh, keep my travel in your prayers. Keep Mr. Harbor's travel in your prayers. Um, so if you have any requests that need to be added, you can text uh, those to me. Um, also, just as a public service announcement that I give every once in a while, okay, I will take uh, photos. Um, they don't have to be embarrassing, but it's probably better if they are. Uh, not of you, of course, for the front of the bulletin. Okay, I'm taking photos for the front of the bulletin. And the way that I like to receive those is my email, and my email's listed right there on the front of the bulletin. Okay, so I could use, I, this one's from the summer, okay? Like, it's not summer anymore. I mean, it's about to be summer again, hopefully, someday. But it's not summer now. Um, so new photos would be awesome. Um, there's your PSA and end PSA. All right. <clears throat> so we'll sing song number 627. And there's a royal banner. 
and then uh, Mr. Downing is going to come up uh, and have a prayer for us. All three verses of 627. There's a royal banner. morning. Good morning. Go to God in prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we are once again truly thankful for this time that we can come to you. Father, first giving thanksgivings for all that you do for us. Father, for all those things that are listed here. Father, for the emergence that took place. And Father, for all those who have been sick that are feeling better. Father, we're grateful and thankful how you uh, work in our lives. Father, how you uh, bring joy to our lives through uh, fellowship, Father, through uh, all those things that you give us that bring joy to us. Father, we just uh, pray that uh, we would always come to you first with thanksgivings. Father, I just pray you'd be with all those that are on a concerned list. Father, it's long. Uh, Father, there's many here, those who are suffering. Uh, Father, I just think of... Rose Sister Shelley and Father, her surgery, I just pray that you you be with her and help her to heal quickly. Father, be with all those who are uh, suffering with colds and flus. And Father, uh, I just pray that you'd be with them, help up, uh, each one of us to do the things that we need to do to stay healthy. Uh, Father, to stay strong, be able to do the work that you call us to do. That's to go out and seek and save the lost. Father, I just pray that each one of us would make this a priority in our lives. Father, that we would uh, take time out of our busy schedules to uh, reach out to someone this week. Father, let them know that we're thinking about them, that we care about them. Father, I just uh, love you so very much, and I thank you for all these things in your son's blessed name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good morning, saints. Good morning. I'm going to be looking at Matthew uh, chapter 20 this morning. If you'd like to turn over there with me, Matthew chapter 20. And I'm going to begin in verse 20. <clears throat> Matthew 20, 20 says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down, making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit on your, on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be First among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What a powerful concept. What a powerful picture <clears throat> that the King of Kings would come to serve his own creation. The King of Glory. The Alpha, the Omega, the one in, who spoke the universe into existence, would come to serve His creation. <coughs> Why? Sure, man was in a, mankind was in a, a helpless state and needed a Savior. It's absolutely true. And we could say that that is the, the reason that that Christ came to serve. But I believe that there's even more to it than that. There's even something more powerful being communicated by God to His creation. <clears throat> you know, the, the guys from JDI, we have a Monday study. Mr. Clark, Mr. Roosh, and Mr. Nagy. And, you know, it's, it's brought forth some great Lord's Supper meditation thoughts, huh, Mr. Roosh? But, uh, um, you know, I've had a lot of that on my mind and what we talked about last week was free will. You know, how when God gave mankind free will, He opened the door for evil to come into the world. You know, a common question is, how can a God so loving and so great allow evil to exist, allow bad things to happen? Well, it's because He gave us free will that there is evil. Because if if God would have just made us all robots, you know, what would that be like for God? I mean, what would, what would He gain from that if we served Him out of, you know, a programming, for, for lack of better terms, and not out of choice? You know, so <clears throat> God gave mankind free will because He wants us to choose to serve and to love Him. And when we think about the King of Kings coming to serve and to, coming to, get, to come and to give His life as a ransom for many, as it says there in Matthew. It's a powerful picture that's communicated to us. And God is, is urging us through His love to choose Him, to choose to love and to serve Him. 
First Peter chapter two. First <clears throat> Peter chapter two and verse twenty one. <clears throat> chapter two, verse twenty one. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his foot in his steps, who committed no sin nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. You were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Jesus set an example for us to die to self, to follow in his footsteps, to choose him. See, the, the oldest lie that Satan's been running from the beginning of time is that it's all about you, that you're at the center of your universe. You know, that's how he holds the masses slavery to sin by convincing them that, that their life is all about them. But the truth is, is that it's all about God. And once we come to realize that and come to serve Him, that's when we experience real life. <clears throat> but we must constantly choose to serve the Lord and not self. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It's a decision that has to be made every second of every minute of every day, of every hour of every day. It's not something that we, it's not a decision that we make one time, because again, we have free will. We got to continue to choose to put the Lord first place in our lives. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he was saying to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Again, it's not about us. It's about the Lord. And the one thing I noticed there in that verse 23, it says, And he was saying to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily. You know, we don't just choose to serve the Lord once and then we're done. We've got to make that decision perpetually, continually, all the time to put him first place in our lives. Because again, the lie that Satan is running is that it's all about you. And he wants to try to use the things of the world to distract you, to pull you away from what really matters, and that's serving the Lord. You ever wonder why um, you know, the Lord chose the first day of the week to come around His table? To remind us of what's really important. It's the first thing that we do on the first day of the week. The precedent, the priority is put on Him. Now these emblems are a reminder of God's love for us. And that it's all about Him. It's not about us. Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly, Almighty God in heaven, we're thankful for the gift of free will. And with that gift comes great responsibility. Father, you told us in the, script, in the Scriptures to choose life. And there's consequences for choosing life. There's also consequences for choosing death. Father God in heaven, Jesus chose life. He was not programmed he had free will in all ways. He made all the decisions that led him to the cross. To think of you humbling yourself to the point of man, to be pierced through, to be hung on a piece of wood, to have your creation mock you, scourge you, punish you, to have all those things happen, to understand that in that moment in time you were separated from the Father. Father, there are so many different aspects that went on in Calvary. I can't even imagine what your son went through for us. Father God in heaven, he chose life. And with that choice, he 
you are such a great example for each and every one of us. Father God, have, this is a choice we need to make daily. We need to die to self. We need to look to you. We need to raise your name up. Help us to remember the cost that it took for us to partake in this meal. That the King of Kings led the example, laid down his life, Father. Such a great example. I pray that we never take this for granted. Father, I say in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. morning. Start turning to to Nehemiah. I'm going to cheat because I already got my ribbon there. (laughs) I love the Old Testament. I'm so glad that we're going through 1st and 2nd Samuel. Um, Prayer. So many different aspects of prayer. And sometimes I think we take prayer for granted. We have these prayer lists that are put in front of us every week. We add to them and we're thankful for those situations that have increased or gotten better. But sometimes I wonder, and I find myself guilty of this, kind of throwing up a, a nuke-warm prayer on behalf of somebody just for God to, just to intervene in that situation and not really look at but how I could help the situation. Because we were called to be His hands and His feet when we were in this world. I mean, we are a light to all those around us. And sometimes we need to understand, like, where can I help? And we need to look at that aspect of prayer. But one thing I want to, and I'm not sure if the men have ever touched on this, is fasting with prayer. And the Bible mentions it quite often. And it usually seems like when people are fasting when they're praying, is a point where they're emotionally at a fork in the road, and they just don't know which way to go. And I mean, I want to look at Nehemiah. This happened in chapter 1 of Nehemiah's life. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekiah, Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the twentieth year while I was in Susa, the capital. Hananiah, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came and asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and, and had survived the captivity in about Jerusalem. Verse 3, And he said to me, The remnant there is in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now it came about when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for the days I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open to hear the prayers of thy servant, which I am praying before thee now day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel, thy servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, I in my father's house have sinned. In my mind, taking fasting and prayers, taking prayer to a new level. It's almost like not even saying, I'm, I'm throwing these words out there for you to hear, but I want to put action behind my words. I want to separate myself from the world. I want to not eat. Because usually when you think of fasting, it's the loss of food. You're not eating. There are times in the, in the scriptures where it talks about not uh, eating and drinking, but I wouldn't... Uh, do those for a prolonged period of time, but usually it's fasting from food. And when you're going to do this, it's a time where you want to say, God, I want to set this time apart for you. I want to fast and pray, and I want to have my mind open to your will. I want to be able to put these things before you because I'm really at an impasse. I don't know which way to go. Enlighten me. Give me some wisdom here. And he did this for a couple months, fasting and praying. And what comes about is he's the cupbearer that goes before the king. And eventually the king says, Why, what's your problem? Why do you look so sad? Well, he's like, my people the, the, in Jerusalem, the walls are torn down and they're, they're in shambles. And I really want to go back there and be able to help. And then he start, Nehemiah actually starts listing the things that he needs to have to have in order to make this a possibility. Sometimes in this world we are so quick to react. And sometimes that is the greatest and worst thing that we do. We react so fast that sometimes we need to take a step back and we need to ask for prayer. We need to ask God, how should, what's the best path for, what is the best, best path forward? Not only for me, but for, my king, for the kingdom as well. So I encourage you to, to fast and to pray. I, there was a point, real quick, there was a point in my life when I was a new Christian. I think I was maybe a year, year and a half in. Freshly married too. Me and Alicia, we had a farmhouse out in the country. Unfortunately, I lost my job. We were, unfortunately, we couldn't pay the bills. We had to close the house up for the winter. We actually moved in with the, the in-laws. For a man to have to be put in that position is not good. Because that, I mean, you want to provide for your wife. I can't remember, I think Elijah might have been born. So now I can't provide for my wife and my kids. The house is closed up and I'm living with the in-laws. Lost my job. I mean, as a man, you feel low. And I, I took a day, I remember taking a day, because I, I was the only one at the house, and I fasted and prayed. And I went out in the garage, and I humbled myself, and I said, I don't know what to do. 
I don't know what to do. I lay these options before you. Please show me something. Encourage me to pick a path, to move, to move forward. Eventually that path was to go back to school. Eventually that path was, led me to JDI. And, and that's where I'm at today. But sometimes we need to humble ourselves. We need to put that out there. We need to say, God, this is where I'm at. I am humbling myself before you. Please give me wisdom and insight in which is the best direction for my life and for the kingdom. Nehemiah was there. Moses was there. Jesus was another great example of fasting and prayer. So I encourage you, to, if you ever get to an impasse, a fork in the road, pray and fast at the same time. And then see how he's going to respond to your prayer. Let's pray. Our Father and God in heaven, Lord, we're so grateful and thankful to live in this dispensation in which we do, that we have your ear, Lord, and that we know that you hear our prayers, uh, Father, and that you answer them in accordance with your will. Father, help us never to take that lightly, to, uh, Father, to not take advantage of the fact that, that you want us to come to you with our concerns and with, Lord, the things that uh, are on our hearts and on our minds. I, I pray that we would, Lord, come to you often and that when it's necessary that we would also uh, make sacrifices, Lord, as Adam has brought forth with the, with the fasting and, Lord, to demonstrate, Lord, the, not only to you because you already know, but to, even to demonstrate to ourselves through that process the seriousness of our concerns, Lord, and to help us draw nearer to you in times of need. We just uh, praise you and we thank you that you love us so much and that you've, that you've given us these avenues that we can come to you, Lord. We praise you and we thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The two to five year olds uh, can follow uh, Miss Brenda and uh, Miss Layla right out of here. Two to five year olds. <clears throat> I'm not missing any birthdays, am I? Okay. Not, not, not little ones' birthdays. All right. <laughs> so, um, two to five year olds. A little distracted, sorry. Uh, um, so uh, we really appreciated the thoughts there uh, from uh, Matt uh, around the Lord's table. It really is about um, service. Jesus came to serve, uh, not to be served. And so uh, he's created uh, kids that are going to serve in the same way uh, that their dad served. And so really appreciated uh, those thoughts that uh, Matt brought out um, this morning. Uh, the 6 to 11 year olds uh, can follow uh, Mr. Ryan Clark uh, right out of here. 6 to 11 year olds. Appreciate the thoughts uh, from Mr. Roosh uh, there uh, concerning prayer and fasting and how putting those things uh, together uh, really can help uh, focus us uh, with, with some real intention uh, behind it. So, appreciated those thoughts as well. Mr. Arbor, come preach to us. <clears throat> Morning, church. Morning. How are we doing today? Great. Uh, <clears throat> if you haven't been in the practice of coming to uh, first hour, Sunday night, Wednesday night, the men have been doing a tremendous job going through 
Second uh, Samuel. And, you know, today, Marshall, we, we talked about Uzzah. And, you know, you might read that account and think that, you know, well, Uzzah did something he wasn't supposed to do. But, you know, if you kind of take that back one step, it wasn't what Uzzah did. It was what Uzzah and the people had not done. They had not prepared themselves for an encounter with God. We be turning to Ephesians chapter 2. The church, the encounter with God, can be a dangerous place. Not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Even you, being dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the age of this world, according to the ruler of the authority of the air, of the spirit which is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also conducted ourselves previously in the lusts of our flesh, practicing the wills of the flesh and the perceptions. And we were children of wrath by nature, even as the rest. Ephesians 2, verse 4, But God being rich in mercy because of his much love with which he loved us. Even us, being dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. You are saved in his grace. And God raised us up together with him and seated us together with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Even you being dead in your trespasses and sins. Let's pray. Lord God, we are grateful for your grace. Father, we have the privilege of having this encounter with the holy. Help us to be prepared to know who we are, to know who we belong to, and, Father, to know where we dwell. And help us to act accordingly. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Paul takes this occasion to remind the body of Christ in Ephesus their dreadful condition before they were in Christ. That dreadful condition is dead. They were dead. We were dead dead in our trespasses and sins. 
the judgment of God is not arbitrary. And that's what we need to learn from Uzzah's encounter. God's judgment is never arbitrary. The destroyed spiritual condition of mankind is announced and, and by mercy so that the alien sinner can act constructively concerning the personal situation. Locked, the law locks us up in the jailhouse of sin because it it constrains. So we tend to place a lot of emphasis on behavior, realizing that the behavior is the result of. But sometimes the danger is not because of those who do evil, but because of those who do nothing. Personally dead. Not the news that someone else has died. Birth comes with joy and hope. Death comes with shock and dismay. If God is so good, then why does he allow disease and death? God uses death as a last-ditch effort. Death is there to make us recognize that sin has its effects. The wages of sin is death. Certainly separation from God, but played out physically in the, the termination of animation. Sin masquerades as fun. Uh, ignorance is bliss. But it's really expensive. It may be bliss for a time, but it's really expensive. Ask Uzzah. That's how expensive it is. Loss, separation, darkness, death. We then were separated from God. What caused this separation from God? What causes this tomb-like existence? Why am I... Why, if, if this is such a mess... Then, then, then why? I, I didn't ask to be uh, thrust into this. What causes this separation? And the blessing of free will. That's why it's so important to... Kind of come, you know, first hour, Sunday night. Because all this, all this I mean, if God can hyperlink the scriptures, he certainly hyperlinks the, uh, the lessons. With the, the idea of, of, of the free will, see, it, it's not the sin of your parents that separates you from God. It's not the sin of your grandparents. It's not the sin of Adam and Eve. It's not Adam's sin, the original sin, passed on from generation to generation. But Ephesians says, even you, being dead in your trespasses and sins, not parents, not grandparents, not even Adam is to blame. You walked. 
you walked in which previously you walked according to the age of this world, according to the ruler and the authority of the air, of the spirit which is now working in the sons of disobedience, the prince of darkness, the outcast angel Satan, the adversary of God, stalks the sons of men. And the enemy strikes with temptation, challenging the gift of free will that God has given to mankind. We who were formed in the image of God are now plunged into ruin, rebellion, separation, and death. According, Ephesians says, to the ruler of the authority of the air of the spirit, which is now working in the sons of disobedience. It's no wonder that the world is filled with deception and lying and hate and self-seeking passion. Each individual on the face of the earth, when old enough to be charged with responsibility for their own actions, is appealed to by Satan through fleshly weaknesses. And we sin against God and trespass on foreign property. We eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> because by our free will, we think we can determine what good and evil is. But that is a holy realm. And, and as Uzzah reaches out into that holy realm, determining what is good and evil, well, certainly it's good to keep this ark from falling. Paul reminds us and the saints at Ephesus that we were in that lost and deadened spiritual state. There's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. And Paul reminds us and the saints of Ephesus that we were once in slavery to the rebellious schemes of the devil. We were walking in disobedience to God. The same disobedience that is now at work in this perverted world. Snot-nosed, disrespectful, Self-seeking brats are a stench in the nostrils of God. We need to be brought to remembrance of our condition apart from Christ. Otherwise, we might lose the proper appreciation for the mercy of God that he's extended through the sacrifice and good news of Jesus. Verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 2, among whom we also all conducted ourselves previously in the lusts of our flesh, 
Are you running your body? Or is your body running you? And the perception, and we were children of wrath by nature, even as the rest. But God, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his much love with which he loved us, Ephesians 2, 5, even us being dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. You are saved by, you are saved in his grace. The lust of our flesh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. What's the lust of the flesh? Well, it's the lust of the eyes. It's the lust of the flesh. It's the boastful pride of life. That's, that's the what is, uh, what is the knowledge of, of good and evil. In a decadent Western society, the flesh is, is then encouraged to behave even amongst those chosen of God. The, 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 the pattern is set up for the flesh to behave like a like a, a disrespectful, self-seeking, snot-nosed brat. And whatever that spoiled brat wants, it demands now. Whatever it desires, it throws a temper tantrum until it gets its own way. You ever notice how kids can justify anything they want? You ever notice how we can do the same with God? See, we think of lust oftentimes like, uh, uh, you know... Uh, as, as though it has sexual connotations, and certainly it, it does, but it doesn't end there. See, so lust can take a, an infinite number of forms. Uh, laziness. Lust for power. Lust for financial self-control. Uh, you know, the, the lust that presents itself by uh, not allowing our adult children to grow up. The, the lust of, of, of having a, a bad attitude. Now, now the non-Christian is a, a natural or earthy man. He's concerned about you know, things of this earth. And his imagination can carry over into all kinds of, of depravity. But the redeemed of God, we don't allow ourselves to play these mind games. That is really the counterculture. See? That, that we don't let the, the culture begin to slip in and, and take the things of God lightly to where the, the, the profanity of the, of the world, like in Uzzah's case, begins to set the standard for, for God's holy people. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 says, taking every thought captive to Christ. Now think about taking them captive. So, What's the thought, you know, what's the, what's the overarching thought I need to take captive? God determines good and evil. I need to eat from the tree of life. See, as God's kids, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 2, taking every thought captive, 
And God has raised us up together with him and seated us together with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that, or in order that, in the coming ages, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. We are the showcase round. <laughs> God is preparing a bride to show off. Now, the church can be a dangerous place, not always because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. You, you, you've seen the, the, the scurrying around on a, a wedding day, getting, getting ready for the ceremony. You kind of think that maybe there was something, uh, something funny about the relationship if... Uh, you know, if, if the bride didn't, didn't take any time to prepare, she just showed up in sweats and t-shirt and, you know. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore, we were buried together with him through immersion into his death. Now, how was Jesus, you see, ascended to glory? Well, through the vehicle of his death. How are we seated with him? Through the vehicle of Jesus' death. Ephesians, or, or, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 we were buried together with him through immersion into his death in order that just like Christ was raised up from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might also walk in the newness of life. For if we've become unified together with him in the likeness of his death, but also we will be unified with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, as I should have known, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away, no longer for us to be enslaved in sin, for he who has died has been made righteous away from sin. Verse 8, Romans chapter 6, But if we died together with Christ, we believe that we will also be living together with Him. Knowing that Christ, having raised up from the dead, dies no more. Death has no more Lordship over him. That the death, he died to sin, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he is living to God. An eternal life to an eternal God. That's why Paul can say, O oh, death, where is your sting? Because in Christ our eternal life began as we walk with him. So, verse 11 says, Count yourselves to be indeed dead to sin, but living to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And unless a person is truly repentant, 
truly willing to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus and is immersed into Christ and continuing to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, unless that is the criteria, that person is a child of God's wrath to be executed. The wrath is to be executed at the Lord's second coming. No exceptions. No exceptions. I didn't know. I was raised by wolves. <laughs> you know what? You've got the word. And we should be, as God's family, mindful of our former state of darkness so that we can be truly grateful to the Savior who rescued us. And we might be a, a living bridge to those who are trapped in their own fleshly desires. And only, only by recognizing the hideousness of our sin can we begin to appreciate the goodness of God. See, we want to make this a safe place. And a safe place doesn't involve just, just staying out of trouble and keeping your head down. See, even, even the church can be a dangerous place, not because of those who outwardly do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. It's not what Ezra did. It's what the people of God had not been doing. But God, rich in mercy, because of his great love, has made us alive in Christ, has seated us with Christ in the heavens. And the child of God is a king as well as a priest under the new covenant. God not content with merely to forgive, God raised the dead. And Jesus is the first fruit. Well, not denying the second coming and the, and the raising of the body from the dead, but spiritually, if you are immersed into Christ, if you are walking in the footsteps of Jesus, you are an eternal entity at the present. You've been seated on the throne with Christ in the heavenly places. You are a priest and a king. And that is motivational. Now, well, use, the, use the, well, the, the bride of Christ. The, and, yeah. Uh, I hesitate to call it a, a, a metaphor because it's, it, it's not a metaphor. It, it's more real. See, it, 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 it's the spiritual reality. It, 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 it's, it, it's more real than, than your physical marriage. So, you know, you take this man to be, you take this wife Do you really believe the scripture and the awesomeness of this great God? Do you believe that God has a great love for you? You believe that God is rich in mercy? You believe that you no longer dwell on the earth, but by faith 
you are dwelling in the heavenly realms. Do you really believe that you've been raised with Christ and seated with him? The wedding ceremony had proceeded without a hitch up to that point. Flower girls were flowering, ring bearer was bearing, everything was going great. Until we get to the point, do you take John to be your lawful wedded husband? There was an incredibly long and unbelievably awkward silence. No one knew at the time for sure if the bride had just zoned out for a moment or she was actually contemplating how she wanted to answer. No groom deserves to have a hesitant bride on his wedding day. For the bride of Christ to have second thoughts about her husband must be so disappointing to Jesus. The good news, however, is that God doesn't turn and walk away. He waits patiently, remaining at the altar, standing at the door, knocking, waiting for his bride to say, I do. I do. Revelation 19, 7 says we should rejoice and should be glad and should give the glory to him because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has prepared herself. The church can be a dangerous place, not always because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. Preparing ourselves, knowing that love, knowing who we are, being active to be the apple of God's eye, to be the showcase, because this is for the purpose of God to demonstrate to the heavenly realms his holiness through you. Oh, I want to go to heaven. That's a big motivator. But let God be true and every man a liar. And you know what? That's going to be proven through his new creation. Salt, light, and a city on a hill. Yep. Sometimes we have tough weeks. You know what? You were made for this. You were designed for exactly this. And you were designed to have victory. And that victory is in Jesus. If you haven't been living in victory, you can. Not by trying harder. But by eating from the tree of life. If you're hungry, it's here. Let's stand, let's sing first and last verse of 470, Victory in Jesus.
470. <laughs> I heard all the story of sin came from glory. I gave his life on Calvary to save the wretch like me. I heard the heart is from me, but the fresh blood that's on me. And I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Come on back tonight at uh, 6.30. We'll uh, be back in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6, uh, and uh, we'll be starting at uh, verse 12. Matt will have a lesson tonight. And so uh, come on back this evening and uh, uh, be fed. So I know that it, Dathan's got a birthday coming up. Dick's got a birthday coming up. Anybody else have a birthday coming up next week? Well, we need to sing to them. I'm not going. I'm not going to say anything about how old you are. I wouldn't admit it. Okay, I know. That's because I know. That's because I know uh, who makes the best coleslaw. Huh? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. So, yeah, but, well, somebody was born a few days Happy before. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. We wish you a happy birthday. We wish you a happy birthday. We wish you a happy birthday. Happy birthday. Anything else we should do? Well, yes, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. Father, help us to realize what a privilege it is of all creation, of all the times past, that we get to be seated with Christ in glory. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. One, two, three. Let's get ready to rumble.